Welcome to the Ortho Joe Show, a joint production of the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery and Ortho Evidence. In our world, orthopedic research is king, and current topics from our respective publications are analyzed weekly. Here is Mohit Bhandari from Ortho Evidence and Mark Swinkowski from the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery. Well, welcome to another uh, Ortho Joe podcast. Uh, morning, morning, Mark. I just hope you've got your little cup Cheers. of Java. Excellent. Yeah. So this weekend you know, at Ortho Evidence, we published uh, a piece that I think would be a useful discussion. I'd love to get your insight on it. And I've always used the term data is the differentiator in surgery. And without it, the loudest voice often wins and patients often lose. If you look at the extremes of what happens. This weekend, we published a OE original on the topic of the digital enterprise, moving from paper to... Yeah, I made a, I made a copy of it. Oh, there you go. Okay, so you know the storyline. So how, how is data redefining how we think about surgery and specifically what's happening in the uh, atmosphere of journals? So here's a couple of quotes I want to start with, and I wouldn't mind getting your take on uh, these quotes and these um, perceptions. So Stanford Medicine, Scope Blog writes... The recent explosion of printed and digital resources offer students alternatives to the classic textbooks that previous generations swore by. As a result, medical tomes are no longer the primary means by which students learn medicine, but just one piece of an increasingly complex puzzle. Now, Summers in 2018 has this provocative statement that saying the scientific paper is rapidly becoming obsolete. Scientific methods have evolved now at the speed of software. And yet the basic means of communicating scientific results hasn't changed over the past 400 years. In fact, papers may be posted online, but there's still a picture on a page. What would you get if you designed the scientific paper from scratch today? And that left me thinking a lot about, you know, where are we heading with respect to um, evidence and how is the whole scientific method and process going to be improved as we try to get information um, to the countless surgeons and healthcare providers that, you know, depend on journals, uh, for example, right now and the content they provide. Yeah, so this is really a futuristic discussion, isn't it? And um, the issue is that the future is coming really, really quickly with how we have seen the advent of concepts like uh, preprints uh, and the idea of upending the, the standard peer review process and putting the information out there and hoping that individuals will provide scholarly input into what's been written and then revise the manuscript and then ultimately uh, publish it. So that, that's one idea that has sort of sped up uh, the whole pr production process and, and, and put it out there more in the public realm. But as you know, uh, in ortho evidence, you've written a lot about COVID COVID nineteen and the misinformation that has come out of that sort of approach. So we still are left with a situation where we 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 really need, in a, in essence, to protect the public, to protect our patients, and protect our readers from making bad decisions. We need to have informed inf uh, individuals making an analysis of whether what's been written is true and accurate. Um, so. It, it, it is uh, coming quick. Uh, I think at the current time, we're, we're stuck with the current paradigm of uh, blinded peer review. So we, we try to limit bias as much as we can, but we've got to have more sophisticated ways of aggregating information that is past that bar of peer review uh, because the, the volume of information is, is expanding so rapidly. So uh, you, you and I have talked about this oh, quite oh, a bit. Uh, uh, so how do you think ultimately we can, I guess, limit the uh, information that we're going to analyze uh, for individuals using whatever software uh, uh, enhancements that we, we develop? How, how are we going to uh, protect the, the intake process into the, the data that gets into that process being accurate uh, and, um, and, and having past review from knowledgeable individuals. Well, you know, and I, I think you raised two points. So you said two things, which is, you know, we're in this information epidemic and more than any other time, I think we've both learned, right? We both learned that um, the individuals 
who are giving this information, I think are being scrutinized at a level I don't think they were scrutinized in the past because there is so much misinformation. So now we're into the world of, okay, well, where's your data coming from? But also who is, who is the vehicle, whether it's a journal, whether it's an online tool, whether it's an individual, who is the source of this information? And we've seen that in this particular era, we're dealing with two issues. So the one thing though, that is an absolute truth. And it happens all the time. I think daily it happens, which is we are we have information at our fingertips, but it's in a way we can't use it. Like when you look at, in many cases, you know, the historical medical chart, well, the historical medical chart was, you know, a hugely powerful tour for, for many of us. And for, when you look at the earlier, earlier decades of JBJS, I mean, the case report was a fundamental tool and the storylines. And then chart reports became digitized, but they're still just pictures digitized, right? So you still have to go through the original chart and you could almost say that the chart should be broken down into information. And then, you know, and then how is that information actually gonna be collated and tagged? That's just one of hundreds of different examples um, that we're having to struggle with. And that's the challenge, right? The challenge is we're, you know, looking around us and saying all the information we collect, is it locked somewhere? Or do we have ready access to it? And do we have enough foresight now to develop the tools so in the future we can reap the rewards of all this you know, information? Yeah, maybe we could talk a little bit uh, about the current status of the tools. For perhaps some in our audience, they, they may not be, uh, I guess, facile with the concept of machine learning. So we've published a few manuscripts. I, I checked this morning on what we've published on machine learning. One of them came out of your group regarding COVID-19, COVID but another one came out of the estimating the risk of, and I think it also is uh, attached to McMaster, estimating the risk of infection following uh, management of tibial shaft fracture. So what what is exactly machine learning? How, how would you describe that to our audience? Yeah, and by no means am, am I an expert in this, so I'll, I'll make that disclaimer right up front. But, you know, the question I've always asked is, you know, everyone, I mean, if you look at a lot of, um, you know, hot topic areas, certainly the concept of machine learning or AI, artificial intelligence, or human-assisted AI, all these terms are coming, um, coming forth and are coming forth very fast. It reminds me of 1990s when... Uh, Gordon Guyatt, and, and you know Gordon Guyatt very well too, Mark, you know, uh, started postulating this term evidence-based medicine and basically created a nomenclature associated with it. And many of us were just caught up in the smoke and mirrors of what we thought was all these terms. But then you realize there's real methods to all these, um, all these issues. And most of us are just confused because we didn't understand it. Machine learning to me is, you know, the principle that a machine, in this particular case, a, comp a computer, for example, in the simplest terms, is able in many ways to learn from insights. And so I'd always say, well, how does a computer learn from insights? And at the simplest level, uh, it's been explained to me, well, from experts, they say, well, the lowest hanging fruit in machine learning algorithms is often recognizing something on an image. So it's something that you can get lots of images. Um, you can you know, create an algorithm that says, you know, recognize that circle as a potential tumor and we can get accuracy on that. And then say, well, how does it learn? Well, it learns by doing more of them, but also having feedback from, a, let's say in this case, a human who says, no, that's not a tumor, that's the tumor. Oh, okay. So there's, there's this still feedback loop that is really, really important in how that computer um, and that algorithm may learn. So um, at a very simple level, I understand the process, but I have a feeling, and I'm pretty sure I'm correct on this, is that 90% um, of um, groups that are uh, purporting to be using machine learning or AI are uh, far from that. In fact, they're not even close to using the potential of, of the tool and the power that we have. And that really gets back to that issue, right? Which is historically, right? When you think about technology, like we have so much technology at our fingertips and I think it's gonna take us a lot of time to understand how to really use this. So who knows what journals will look like in a decade from now? or let alone two decades from now. But you can almost imagine it will not be what they are now because there's so much more power in the way we do and computational methods are just so bad, so much better now than they used to be. Sure, yeah, I, I am quite convinced that the, the standard way that we present information as a single article uh, is, 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 not, is not gonna be around very much longer. I would estimate within a decade, we'll, we're gonna look very, very different as to how we present information to our, our readers. 
Well, the, you know, patient decision making. But yeah, go well, ahead. Yeah, so I was going to say, like, you know, there was an Apple scientist that was quoted in one of in this review we did on the weekend, uh, Brett Victor, and he wrote something really interesting to me. And I imagine that we can get there. He says that you know one of the methods that um, that could lead to the future of what scientific papers could be is these things called computational notebooks. I don't know if you've heard of this term, but they allow for interactive diagrams um, work within the text. So, and it's also as new information comes through being updated. So it almost like, it almost like it'd be like the living journal of bone and joint surgery rather than, so imagine a situation, and this is purely hypothetical in which you can have interactive diagrams. It's an interface so you don't come in specifically to an individual set of papers, but you come into an interface in which, um, you know, your authors who have submitted to the journal, for example, could be when they have new insights, they could be updating the right. living document rather than republishing, let's say, a follow up paper as an example. But I, mean, I don't think we're there yet or anywhere close, but you can imagine that that's what's happening um, in some of the big technology groups. That's how they're re-envisioning or thinking about the future. Right. But I think you and I agree that there's still going to be a role for um, uh, unbiased observers uh, passing on whether or not the information that's presented has been analyzed in the correct way, in uh, rather than just throwing things out there that uh, any anybody oh. can, can throw out. Um, oh. You're right, and and uh, you know, and right now, um, not not to not to derail what we're talking about now, but you can imagine that, you know, here we are in the midst of a in various peaks of a second wave of COVID, and we're already now talking about the third, fourth, and dare I say, fifth waves of COVID, and the power of individuals, and in our surgical community, surgeons, are going to be put to the test, and so, you know. We did look at this and we had some um, of our membership ask about, you know, who is a trusted source of information as an individual? And, you know, as you can imagine, there's a nice little acronym that goes under the word trust, but it's like, first one is always transparency. Right. You know, if you have a conflict, you've got to let people know what that conflict is. You have to have a resume that supports the thing you're speaking about. So, you know, we have this, uh, it's called the Dunning-Kruger effect because I happen to know something, people assume I know everything. Mm -hmm. And so right. people ask my opinion on sports and I'm thinking I'm the wrong person to ask an opinion <laughs> on a particular sporting event uh, because I can, you know, maybe, maybe talk to you about statistics. So mm. that point taken um, use of high quality data to support your opinions. And you and I both believe, you know, randomized trials and high quality blinded data and, you know, peer reviewed data is an important data source for us to, um, to be able to do and the strength of reputation. So in other words, um, you know, be at an institution and organization that otherwise other people believe has done good work. And last but not least, testimonials. Do other people um, independently look at you or that individual as a potential, uh, you know, unbiased, trustworthy opinion? Those sorts of things are going to be where we're going to be leaning on those those organizations and those types of individuals for sure. Well, you and I are both working very, very hard to maintain that trust uh, in ortho evidence and in JBJS, uh, and uh, we we are open to anybody who. Uh, who has questions or considerations or uh, would like clarification about how, how we do that, because we, we definitely want to have that reputation of being a trusted source of information. So may, maybe we could conclude uh, the conversation this morning by just um, ask, asking you, uh, how, how might you envision uh, a patient care related tool, let's say a decade from now, what might a, a, a patient facing tool look like for surgeons to make decisions about, let's just say, uh, I'll, I'll pick out of the air, uh, a, a, a distal, we're, we're both trauma surgeons mm -hmm. by background, but a, a distal femur fracture um, that uh, is uh, intercondylar and displaced, uh, should you use a percutaneous nail with percutaneous screws versus a, a plate? H how might you envision the way information might be available for clinical decision making facing patients. Sure, at the very specific, at the very specific question of what do I do? What would be right. the treatment offered? You know, the word uh, point of care would be, I think the, the key, which is at your fingertips, data at your fingertips. And so um, we'd have to have, uh, 
Uh, and, and it exists now in other areas. I think we can transfer some of that technology for sure into the surgical field and certainly in orthopedic. So a point of care tool uh, that would have a ready question and answer database. So not so much as, hey, here's a paper, read the paper before right. you walk in, but you have a question. Um, here is the, based on, we know based on the system, knowing about who you are as an individual and your background, they would it would be able to pull out uh, an answer for you. Very similar to how Google pulls out answers, right? Google suggests, and they're usually the first five are right. Something is right. I think we'd have to, we have the technology, we'd have to build it into our own uh, orthopedic, I think, um, software. But you can even go further. You can have a situation that, you know, once um, that all of the patient information that's relevant has already been uploaded into the application that you have. So by the time you walk in, it's already said to me, hey, uh, Dr. Bandari, um, the, the patient that you are seeing now, as we can tell, because you know, you're in proximity and, and we know that you're in this room, and blah, blah, blah. The patient you're seeing now, we already know from the chart material that this patient has a supracondylar fracture. Um, these are the uh, issues. Are, there, are, are you considering any of these for treatment? Group. You press treatment, it gives you the answer. By the way, once the patient is discharged um, using wearable sensors, information comes back to you and says, oh, patient has an elevated fever. You might want to have someone contact them that they may be having an early infection. You can go on and on and on. Yeah. Um, so we are really looking at completely changing the way uh, we interact with our patients. But it still begins with one thing that you and I believe very, very strongly about. Nothing happens without good quality data. That's a great way to stop. And uh, I just want to remind our listeners that we're very open to uh, any dialogue you might uh, provide for us. Uh, you can uh, contact us uh, through the, our respective websites uh, and ask a question. And we'll in intend to have a mailbag here on Ortho Joe and get back to your questions and readdress them at the start of uh, each, uh, each episode. So uh, Mo, uh, I know you've got a busy day as uh, chair of surgery. You've got a lot to do. and uh, and I'm going to get back to uh, processing some manuscripts so we can work towards that future you just described. So wonderful. More, <laughs> more coffee. Have a great day.